Now here's the last part. Here's the danger. And I want to really point it out to you because James warns us. L look at verse 16. He says, watch out. If you're not living confidently doing God's will, seeing the plan of God that life is short, if, if you're caught up in the money thing, look out. Verse 16, because you'll boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Living anything apart from a humble, sacrificial life for Christ is boastful arrogance. Thinking that, that God left us here for anything other than to sacrifice all for the cross of Christ is boastful arrogance. That doesn't mean we take the vows of chastity and poverty and, uh, and all that and go around like a, a, a monastic type and, 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 and live in poverty. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about uh, what we wear, per se, or what we eat. He's talking about what we live for. He's talking about the operating system of our life. And the danger of my life, he says in verse 16, is going through life alone without God's way, that's humility, and without God's word, that's this book you have here as your operating system. And what he says is, it's dangerous to do your own thing. Verse 16, if you live this boastful life of arrogance, it's evil. And if you know what is God's good way and don't do it, verse 17, it's sin. And you know it's sin to say, someday, when I get this and this and this and this done, then I'll do it. Because you might not have a someday. Now, what he's presenting for us here is that God says, I want to guide you through the maze of life myself. He said, I want you to go my way, and I want you to follow my plan. And he said, you can't do it on your own. I want to take you myself. That reminds me of, uh, I remember preaching... Uh, my first sermon, or my, my last sermon in May of 1995, before we took off for Jeremiah's birth. Uh, we had to go back to Rhode Island, some of you remember, in 1995, because of our medical plan. They said, we don't want any children born in Oklahoma on this plant. They have to be born in Rhode Island. I said, thanks a lot. Okay, so we went back, so they would pay for it. And as we went back, we were driving across the country. Bonnie was nine months expectant. And we went through Kentucky, and of course, you know me, I saw a sign that said, Mammoth Cave. And I've always, I thought, wow! We're driving right by it, honey. Can we stop? She went, oh, sure. You know, we can make it, I think. How long before we get to Rhode Island? I said, oh, we'll make it. Don't worry, honey. So we pulled in and got in line. And, and you know, she was in that kind of, you know, feeling along stage, you know. And, and I said, let's go on the cave tour. She says, oh, okay. And so here all of us get going. And we descend down in this large cave system. It's just labyrinthical. And it's just miles of caverns. And everything was going great until we got to this one part where it's where it really narrows down and there's a stalactite here and a stalagmite there. And she went and she couldn't get in or out. She was lodged right in that thing. And there are all these people on the steps coming down and the guide's there and she looked and it was really neat. You know, we were and our whole family and, and finally she was, got through the stalactite. I'll always remember that. A few husbands have ever done that. That was one of the most memorable parts of our stop. But that's not what was most important. The part I'll never forget is after she got through that little tight spot and the whole group got down in this big underground chamber. And they told everybody, they said, now hold on to something. We're going to turn the lights off. So everybody got ready. They flipped off the lights. And all of you have been in caves. Every time they do this, you just feel like you're immersed in a sea of black ink. You can't, I mean, you feel the darkness, like it says in Exodus, they fell in the plagues. And they just let it be absolutely quiet, and all of a sudden people get nervous and they cough. You know, people don't like darkness. And that's why I can't figure out why people will reject Christ and go to the blackness of darkness forever, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire if they don't like black darkness. So then he flipped the light back on. This is what the guide said. Now follow me closely if you want to find your way out. And that was, you know, we went up and there were no more tight things and we got out. You know what the Lord says? You want to get out of life? Eternal dividends? Follow me closely. You want to get out of the, the cesspool of sin? Do you want to get out of the, the blackness of darkness? Do you want to avoid what Jesus talked about more than he talked about heaven? Jesus talked more about hell than he talked about heaven. Do you want to avoid hell? Follow me closely. 
What James is saying is, have you found the guide who can get you through the labyrinthical maze of life? Have you found the one who will take your hand and let you be led by him to heaven? You know, if you do, and if I do, go God's way. He takes us all the way to the end. One of the more famous songwriters of all time is John Newton. He wrote, uh, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. We all know that about him. But do you know two other things about him? Do you know that he stood at his wife's bedside and she died of bone cancer in a grievous, horrible, protracted, agonizing death where he really wrestled with his faith? Do you also know that he ended his life with what we would call Alzheimer's now? And he lost his mind, basically? I'd like to read to you not about his wife. He had a wonderful ending to that and, and learned a lot. But in his most advanced years, Newton's mind failed. He could no longer preach. He sat in a home, or he laid in a bed in a home, and friends would come to visit him, though he didn't know them. But he always remarked as they came in the same thing. Over and over he'd say the same thing. Someone wrote it down for us. He says, I'm an old man. My mind is gone. But I can remember two things. I am a great sinner, and Jesus is a great Savior. Now that's ending confidently. That is not going our own way. That's the product of making a choice that the purpose of my life is not to gather money. The brevity of my life is part of God's plan. The confidence of my life is doing God's will, and I might add, today. And the danger of my life is going alone, without God's way and without God's word. Have you ever met the guide that can take you all the way to the end and get you out of the cave and take you home to heaven?